welcome to FPTV. Welcome to FPTV new releases on our 12 days of Halloween strand. And right now, it's my pleasure to welcome one of our favourite authors, Grady Hendrix, the author of Horror Store, the author of My Best Friend's Exorcism, We Sold Our Souls, and the screenwriter of Mohawk and Satanic Panic, and the author of one of my favourite non-fiction books about publishing paperbacks from hell. How are you, mate? I'm good. I'm good. I'm sitting here in my, my crummy office surrounded by... Um, pretty much everything that went into the making of, of paperbacks from hell, you know, yeah, little rock and right. roll devil yeah. worship. Um, but I'm good. I'm good. I uh, just uh, wrapping up the book that's coming out in 2021 today and um, sort of finishing up events for Southern book club, which has been bizarre to do during the red death. And that, of course, what a brilliant time to do it in some respects and what a chilling time to do it in others. Um, and that's particularly what I'd like to ask you about. So what can you tell me about your latest book with the fantastic title, The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Van Vampires? With it, that's very kind of you. Most people refer to it as the book with the inordinately long title um, that no one can ever remember. Um, you, you know, so Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires is, in essence, it's a book about a small southern town uh, in the early 90s and um, a book club there, these sort of middle-class housewives, and a stranger moves to the neighborhood and they decide he's um, a serial killer and then they rapidly realize their mistake, he's actually a vampire. And they're convinced that this is what he is and everyone else is convinced they're crazy. And I wanted to do two things with this book um, and, and both of them, took because I was doing these two things, took me a very long time to get it published. Um, the first is I feel like people sort of derisively re 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 talk about book club ladies, you know, and they sort of think of these sort of blonde Southern housewives drinking white wine and reading trashy books. And that's not my experience at all, either with, with Southern housewives or with women in book clubs. I mean, these are people who've chosen to make books a central part of their lives. And housewives, I mean, good God, these are women who've really gone to the mat. They've dealt with their kids getting sick and childbirth and raising a family and doing all this stuff and pretty much getting patronized and dismissed for it. And so I sort of wanted to give them their hero moment because that's how they sort of are. And then vampires are the other component of that. And vampires, you know, we're, we've got so many jokes about sparkle vampires with good abs and they've become really kind of a busted, uh, deflated currency these days. But they've been scary for a long time. And I wanted to get back to that essential, what makes a vampire scary? And really what it is is, you know, they're serial killers to a large yeah. extent. They can yeah. move among us. And, you know, how many times have we seen that interview with the next door neighbor saying he was a lovely man, you know, very quiet, kept to himself. And now they're digging up his backyard full of like, you know, dead children. Um, so I, and, you know, because this was about sort of middle-aged housewives and because it was about vampires, my publisher was really resistant about it at first. I mean, they were like, who's going to read this? Um, and I really, it was a real uphill battle. And how did you, uh, I mean, uh, you must be pleased with the results and pleased with the reception. Yeah, well, the results I'm very happy with, but it took a long time to get there. I am I am a useless and inefficient writer. So there were three versions of this book, like in full, before I got to the version that people have read. Um, it took me a long time to get it right, because a lot of these people are based on people I knew growing up. It's set in the neighborhood I grew up in, and I wanted to make sure I did right by them. And so, you know, sometimes you really have to push yourself to, you know, get to what's right and not just, okay, good enough. And this was a book that couldn't be good enough. And the reception's been great. Uh, this book came out on April 7th when basically everyone in the States was uh, shut down. I was really worried. It came out at a good moment. People were really supportive of the book. It was a New York Times bestseller. And one of the things that really weirded me out is after I did this book, I was putting together a one-man show to sort of go out on the road and do, you know, instead of doing an author event, I wanted to do a show about vampires at all these bookstores. And then when that got shut down, I, I was sitting on all this material and um, I started doing a podcast with it. But one thing I realized in doing that research is vampires have always come around in times of a plague. Like the early vampire legends happened during the big typhus and uh, uh, cholera epidemics. Um, you know, in the 1890s, tuberculosis was a huge killer, and that was when there was a huge vampire panic sweeping the U.S. Um, and rice became enormous. I mean, well, there were huge fears about venereal disease in the 20s yes. and 30s when, yeah. when the Universal yeah. Dracula came out. 
um, Anne Rice, you know, in the 80s with AIDS and, and her vampire books. And then it was kind of like, well, this book came out and then COVID. And I'm not saying one caused the other, but it was just yeah. a really eerie coincidence that I don't know what to make of. I think I, th I think that's fascinating. And I think you're really on to something that I that I hadn't considered. But it is it's kind of it's kind of spooky and rather evocative yeah. that you should be coming out with the book right now. Yeah. Well, I, you wonder, you know, am I writing the book? Is the book writing me? Yeah, like, what's right, going on here? This yeah. is terrifying. <laughs> of course. Now, in the process of uh, living in that vampire world, um, can you share with us any um, sort of vampire other, you've touched on some of them, some vampire novels or, or vampire movies or characters that have been the ones that have stood out to you over the last hundred years or so of popular culture? Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of this came to me after writing the book, because really when I wrote the book, I read a bunch of true crime. I read a bunch of sort of housewife books just to get there and um, in my head. And the only vampire book I read, I read this Montague Summers crazy thing um, published around the turn of the last century called The Vampire in Europe, which is just a crazy collection of folklore by this Anglican priest who really acts like vampires existed. Um, and and then I read Dracula, of course. But um, but after the book was out, doing all this research, I mean, there's so much good stuff out there. I read Whitley Strieber's The Hunger, which yes. the David Bowie movie is yeah, based on. And man, that book is still chilling. It really works. Um, I agree. And yeah, and it's um, and then the other thing that really blew my mind is there was so much vampire fiction before Dracula even came out in 1897. And there was a whole string of books about and stories about psychic vampires, like usually women who just sucked your vitality by being around them. And the same, and so, you know, it, what we do in the shadows has that energy vampire. That was, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. Yeah. They're all over 19th century literature. Um, and there's a great book by a woman named Florence Marriott called Blood of the Vampire, written, that came out in 1897, same year as Dracula. It's about this young girl and like she's just going out on vacation and oh my god she just has so much energy and she wants to talk to everyone and hang out oh your kids are so cute let me take care of them and she just exhausts everyone and slowly <laughs> they get sicker and sicker and yeah. she gets healthier and healthier and and their children die and it's really grim wow um, but it was fascinating to see this kind of emotional vampire trope is goes back like you know into the 19th century um, that truly is fascinating. I, I actually had no sense of that personally. I just thought was that what we do in the shadows, it was a particularly good gag. But it's actually so much more interesting that it's based on yeah. some kind of literary history. Yeah, it's weird. And, you know, vampires, I think, have always been this um, metaphor for disease, I think, because they make so much sense. I mean, you know, the old model in folklore was someone in your family got sick and then they would come after they died, they would come back as a vampire and prey on the family and you know kill them one by one starting with the oldest people and the weakest people well you think that's a pandemic you know someone in the family dies and then everyone else gets it starting with the the people most at risk the oldest and the youngest and you know it's something that's killing the family but you can't lock the doors and keep it out you can't bolt the windows like it keeps getting in so it's really this um amazing metaphor and and truly terrifying when you think about you know being in the early 19th century without really a model for infection or disease, this, these plagues must have been horrifying. I mean, uh, when do uh, they stop? What do they yeah. want? Without having no understanding of what it actually was and no understanding of how infection worked and not, being, not having scientifically decoded all of that, it must have been absolutely terrifying. Yeah, I mean, even in the 18th, you know, the last vampire that was killed was um, in 1893 in the States in Rhode Island where a family had been ravaged by tuberculosis and the people in the village came to the father and the family and were like, you have a vampire and we think it's your daughter. And so this dad and his sick son went to the cemetery with the town. They dug up his entire family, found some congealed blood still in the heart of his, I think, 18 year old daughter who had just died a few weeks ago. They chopped up her body in front of the family, then burned her heart and liver and her brother ate the ashes to Ooh. try to cure himself. I mean, that's grim. And that's 1893. Yeah. I mean, there's electric lights, there's telephones, there's a stock market, there's escalators. And yeah. they're doing this kind of grim backwards stuff in Rhode Island. Like, it's crazy wow. how terrified people must have been. Yeah, that, that is, that, 
that really is it's supremely evocative. I mean, wow, I, I've, 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 I've never heard that before. And it's, it's truly, it's truly fascinating. It's it's so re yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And what's, what's really interesting is this was, you know, people think of New England as being, oh, so civilized. And if this had happened in Appalachia or, you know, out in the countryside somewhere, but you know, New England had been economically ravaged and lots of everyone who was young and wanted a job and moved to a city or moved out west. And they would actually at the time send missionaries into the countryside, into the farming communities who would come back with these horror stories about these New England villages where no one went to church or even had a Bible in the house. And, you know, these people had been sort of economically devastated and left behind by the world. And this disease comes and like you said, they had no model for it. They didn't know what was happening. And you just imagine that kind of fear and hopelessness that would drive you to that. It's really, it's really grim. Yeah, no, I know, of course. Um, it just, uh, and uh, finally on, on, on the subject of, of other vampire treatments, um, had, did you ever watch any of the, the uh, sort of um, vampire movies of the 70s, which is for a period of time, you know, vampire, um, you know, vampire entertainment, I kind of dialed down a bit, but there are a couple of kind of funny little highlights, w one of which I wanted to ask you about actually was The Night Stalker. Have you ever seen that? Oh, Kolchak, The Night Stalker. Yeah. yeah. No, it's great. And, you know, it's interesting. I actually rewatched that recently and, you know, a lot of it's very 70s and clunky and doesn't hold up well. It's got that made for TV kind of, yes. kind of rhythm to it. But some of it is just, you know, dead on. I mean, this whole yeah. thing with these people going missing and, you know, the yeah, and cops set in up. Vegas, where you, where, yeah. which was such a brilliant idea. Where would you live if you're a vampire? Vegas makes a lot of sense. Exactly, because it's so transient. And, you know, that ending is still so cynical and, you know, yeah. just really yeah. downbeat. Um, you know, so, yeah, no, Kolchak was great. And the other one that really shocked me, because I'd never really been a big Hammer fan. Um, I like their non-horror stuff better, like Cash on Delivery and things. But yeah, I rewatched um, the 1958 Dracula. And that thing is red-blooded. It's strong, it is, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty it strong. Is. I mean, Christopher Lee is pretty intense in that. Yeah. And, and you look at the vampire movies that have been coming out before, where vamp he'd really become a joke after, you know, the Universal films. You know, it was, it was these old dark house movies with vampire Dracula meets the Wolfman. And so to see it suddenly a vampire for adults, you know, with, with, with se being sexy and, and sort of very, like, two-fisted, it's, it's really shocking. No, I agree. And I think that's his kind of his ultimate Dracula performance, because throughout the Hammer yeah. series, he, he increasingly becomes like a, a version of the bogeyman and, 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 and his dialogue is minimal, but it's an actual performance in Dracula. It's fascinating to watch. He's very powerful in it, I think. Yeah. I think that's yeah, very I well mean, observed, mate. Yeah, no, it's a really, really good movie. And I, I was sort of shocked because I saw those movies when I was a kid and my memory of them is being very musty and dusty. And that is not a musty movie. Yeah, yeah not at all. Not at all. It's very, it's very powerful. Um, let me ask you about something that's always impressed me about your work is, uh, and I touched upon it with my intro. I, I think um, I think your books have wonderful titles. Yeah. So <laughs> so uh, so uh, Southern Book Club's Guide to Slime Vampires is a great example of that. But, you know, my best friend's exorcism, we sold ourselves. They, they plug directly into um, the genres that you're playing around with. Horror store, it's the same thing. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, is that something you're conscious of that you really work on? Or, or is oh, it? Yeah. How, yeah. So so what's the process for you to come up with so, those great titles? Well, so it's weird. Um, and I really appreciate it, by the way. I work hard on those. Um, but the weird thing is my best friend's exorcism just popped into my head. And actually, my publisher was talking to me because Horror Store had done really well. Well, what else to do next? And I had some ideas that he wasn't interested in, one of which was an early version of Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires. And then I said, my best friend's exorcism. And I'm like, I'm not quite sure what it's about, but it's about an exorcism, I think, in high school. And he's like, title, sold. Like, you know, that's like yeah, the old Roger yeah. Corman thing. That sold on the title. And then it was hard to figure out the book. But... I really, really believe that you don't get, it's, it's a rough world out there and you don't get a lot of chance to grab a reader's attention. You've got a cover and you've got a title and it's gotta be something that sticks. And I also really believe, cause I've done some screenwriting work in having that log line that 
like being able to condense your book to a sentence because there are parts in writing a book like like books are long man there are so many words and yeah, you get okay. i get lost in the middle you know you're just like what is this even about um and having that log line you know my best friend's exorcism it was you know the title and then it's about two girls whose friendship is strong enough to be the devil okay got it back to that like that just keeps you oriented when you're lost and so i really sweat those um Southern Book Club took forever to come up with a good title. And Grady, I've got one final question for you, which is, what is it that scares you? What are you truly scared of? You know, it's funny. It's, um, there's a weird thing that runs through horror fiction and movies and that wound up being the heart of Southern Book Club without me realizing it. And, you know, I'd written a book called My Best Friend's Exorcism that's set in the same neighborhood as Southern Book Club. It doesn't cross over with the characters, but it's set in 1988 in the same neighborhood. And it's a big part of that too. And so it's clearly something that's been haunting me all my life because that's the neighborhood where I grew up. And it's people not believing you. You know, there's a thing in Southern Book Club where these women know that this guy who's moved into their neighborhood is killing people. They know it. But because they're housewives, because they're women, because people view them as belonging to this silly book club where they read all these true crime books and get their heads full of ideas, no one will listen. And, um, and it's also, there's an uh, African-American community in this book where a lot of the people live who are lower income and a lot of them work for these white families and they are having their children killed and they are trying to speak out and say, someone do something, help us because this is happening. And because they're black and because they're poor, no one will listen to them. And I realize that that's one of those things, trying to convince people just to hear you is so desperate. That idea of talking and just people act like you're not even moving your lips yeah. is such a panic, horrible feeling. And it's one of those things that um, it kind of plays out in a lot of different places. I mean, you know, in, in the book, you realize that the most helpless people, the, the African-American community, the poor community, are experiencing this first, this vampire preying on them first. And they're warning everyone else and no one will listen. And you see that happening with global warming when you look at Indonesian fishermen or tribes in sub-Saharan Africa who are having to migrate and move and seeing their way of life destroyed by global warming. You know, it's people on the margins who experience all this stuff first because they don't have the money and the luxury to protect them from it, to buffer them from it. But we ignore them. We ignore that warning at our peril because at the end of the day, this stuff's coming for all of us. Global warming, a pandemic, a vampire, the monsters will come for everyone. It just, you know, does it and it starts with the people who are most marginalized first. And when we ignore them, we're losing our early warning system. Uh, that is so well said, mate. Absolutely true. I, I, I think that's a great answer that, you know, encapsulates you know, your, your work with your fiction, but the situation we're uh -huh. all in, you know, and, and the truth is that, <laughs> yeah. you know, if we don't, if we don't heed those warnings that are right in front of us, we'll all be experiencing that helplessness, helplessness, irrespective of, you know, race, creed, religion, social stature, whatever, you know, I mean, yeah. these are scary times we're living in, you know, it's an interesting oh, yeah. time to be a horror novelist, actually, I think. Oh, it's so weird. And it's hard because I feel like, you know, there is this desire of people to do this one-to-one -one correspondence. Oh, this book is really about this or that. And I feel like at the end of the day, horror is a little bigger than that. It doesn't have to be about the headlines. It's about what's behind them. You know, it's, it's about the thing that makes those headlines scary, not what's happening in those headlines. Yeah, right on, mate. Thank you so much for joining us today, Greg. Yeah. It's, it's been great chatting to you. This has been FPTV new releases and you have been watching Grady Hendrix talking about his epic book The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires. Thanks very much for spending some time with us mate. No thanks for having me man. Yeah great to see you take care. You too.